Okay, welcome back. We're going to continue with our periodic property discussion, and we'll continue talking about the periodic table. Um, we just finished up talking about Dmitri Mendeleev and his first periodic table, and how the periodic table is arranged in order of increasing atomic number. Once again, Mendeleev used atomic mass. Uh, we've changed that to increasing atomic number. And when we do that, we see a recurring pattern, a cycle, so to speak, um, in both the physical and chemical properties of the elements. Of course, that cycle means that these physical and chemical properties repeat themselves over and over and over again. And we talked about melting point. We talked about how elements react with both chlorine and oxygen and the ratio in which they react to illustrate those cyclical properties of the elements. Now, a couple more vocabulary terms, and I want to talk about some periodic properties. The first, the first vocabulary term is called the periodic law. Now, the periodic law states that many of the physical, and this is basically what I've just talked about, and chemical properties of the elements Uh, tend to recur in a systematic manner uh, with, I'm running out of room here, increasing atomic number. So when we uh, arrange the elements in order of increasing atomic number, uh, many of the physical and chemical properties of the elements tend to recur in a systematic manner. Now I also want to define the octet rule for us. Um, we've talked about this in class several times, but we'll go ahead and put it down on paper right now. The octet rule simply states that atoms tend to react to achieve a full outer energy level, and we call that the valence level, oh, level, Let's see if I can spell here, a full outer energy level, or have eight electrons in the outer level. Now, another way of saying eight electrons, we like to say four pairs of electrons. So atoms tend to gain electrons or lose electrons so that they can have four pairs of electrons in their valence level. We call this the octet rule. Of course, it refers to the number eight. We know that the noble gases are all considered stable because they have full octets. Of course, with the exception of helium, that can't have an octet because it only has two electrons, but it has a full outer energy level. Neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon are considered noble because they rarely react with anything at all. Just the larger noble gases can react at high temperatures with the element fluorine. Now, uh, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, tend to react to gain an electron so that they can have an octet. Remember, fluorine's electron configuration is 2s2, 2p5. So it has seven valence. All it needs to do is gain one more somehow, and it can have a noble gas configuration, an octet, just like neon. The same is true with chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. Of course, the oxygen family, these guys need to gain two electrons to gain their octet. So they're probably not as reactive as the halogens because they need to gain two instead of just one. If we take a look at the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, they have one valence electron. So you might think, well, boy, how are they going to get an octet? Well, in the case of lithium, it has three electrons. If it can get rid of one of those, it can become like helium, which has two electrons, which is a noble gas configuration. Sodium has 11 electrons. Hmm. 
Well, neon has 10, which is stable. So what do you think sodium can do? Well, of course, it can lose one electron. Potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium will do the same thing to achieve their noble gas configurations. What about group two, the alkali and earth metals? Beryllium has four electrons. To attain a noble gas configuration like helium, it would need to lose two. Magnesium would need to lose two, so it could become like neon, and so on down the road. Which of these elements, the alkali metals or the alkaline earth metals, would you think would be more chemically reactive? Yeah, probably the alkali metals because they only need to lose one electron to become like a noble gas, whereas the alkaline earth metals have to lose two, which is a bit more difficult, so they would not be, we would suspect, as chemically reactive. All right, let's talk about a couple of chemical properties. Let's define a chemical property. We're going to keep it sort of simple here. This is a property of an element that is predictable based on the element's position on the periodic table. So by looking at the periodic table and identifying the element's position, we can identify certain properties of that element. And there are many of them. Um, when you get a chance, I want you to take a look at a YouTube video which is entitled, um, let's see, it's entitled The Alkali Metals Reacting with Water. Now that's not one that I've produced, but go ahead and search for that and you'll see a neat little video that's done where the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium are placed in water, and they react with water. As you move down the group, you know what I mean by down the group? Down the group, they react more violently with the water. Now, the reason that they react more violently, think about this, is that when we go from lithium to sodium, we gain an energy level. So the outer electron that lithium needs to lose is in the second energy level, pretty close to the nucleus. Sodium's electron that it would like to lose is in the third energy level. It's easier to lose one that's farther away from the nucleus. So we would suspect that sodium would react more violently or rapidly with water. Potassium reacts even faster and rubidium, and wait till you see what happens with cesium. Now I'll show this in class, but you guys go ahead and take a look if you'd like. It's really an interesting video. I think you'll enjoy it. Now, a uh, periodic property that we really need to talk about is atomic radius. This really helps us understand all of the other periodic properties. Now, this graph here shows the atomic radius of an element versus its atomic number. And you can see, when I go from lithium to sodium to potassium to rubidium to cesium, group 1, the alkali metals, the atomic radius increases. When I look at the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, once again, when I go down that group, the atomic radius increases. So I want to answer the question on the bottom of this page first. What is the general trend in, in the size of an atom when you go from top to bottom in a group of the elements in the periodic table? Well, we just saw it increases. The element's radius gets bigger. Well, why is that so? Well, there are two reasons. Number one, when you go down a group, they gain an energy level. And when you gain an energy level, you get those electrons become farther away from the nucleus. And number two is something called an increase in shielding. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, let's talk about both of these. Okay? And let's turn this big piece of paper over here. We're going to draw on this. Let's take the element lift. Uh, let's go with hydrogen, okay? The first member of group one. There's the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. 
and it has an energy level with one electron buzzing around it. The next member of that group is lithium. Here's the nucleus. Its configuration is 1s1, so we have one electron, 2s1. Sorry, it's 1s2. So there's two electrons in the first energy level and one in the second. See how that's farther away from the nucleus than hydrogens. Then after lithium is sodium. Well, sodium's configuration is 1s2, so two electrons in the first energy level, 2s2, so, and 2p6, so there's a total of eight electrons in the second energy level, and then it ends with 3s1, so it has another energy level. So that valence electron is farther away from the nucleus than both lithiums and hydrogens. And then potassium, of course, I draw it over here. We have one energy level with two electrons. The second energy level has eight, right? The third energy level for potassium also has eight electrons in it. 3s2, 3p6, and then it ends with 4s1. So it's even further away from the nucleus, and that happens as I go down the group. We increase energy levels, of course, the atomic radius increases. Well, what is that shielding effect that I mentioned? Well, what do electrons do to each other? Do they attract or do they repel? Yeah, ding, 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 absolutely, they repel. How many energy levels is the valence electron in hydrogen repelling? Well, dumb question, right? It only has one energy level. It's attracted to the nucleus. There's nothing between it and the nucleus. There's nothing repelling this electron farther away. But look at lithium. This valence electron is being repelled by an energy level of electrons. It's pushing this one farther away. That's called shielding. Look at sodium. Look at this valence electron. Isn't it being repelled not only by this energy level, but this one down below as well. It's being repelled by two energy levels, two layers of shielding. And potassium has three layers, layers of shielding on that valence electron. And of course, rubidium, cesium, and francium have even more. So they're pushing that valence electron farther away, increasing the radius. So when you go down the group, the radius increases because you're gaining energy levels and there's an increase in shielding. So I would expect francium to have the largest atomic radius of any member of group one. Radium to have the largest radius of any element of group two. I would expect polonium to have the largest radius of any member of group 16, astatine the largest, and any member of group 17, and so on. And of course, at the top of the groups, we would have the smallest atomic radius. Now, the one that's harder to understand that we need to spend a little bit of time on. When I go across a period, notice what happens to the atomic radius. When I go from sodium to argon, the atomic radius starts out big, but then it decreases, which is counterintuitive. Sodium has an atomic mass of about 23 atomic mass units. Argon has an atomic mass of about 39 or 40 atomic mass units. It is heavier. So wouldn't you expect, as I went across period three, the radius to get bigger? Is that what happens? Does it get bigger when I go across period number three? Nope, it gets smaller. So I'm gonna write that down. When you go across a period, the atomic radius gets smaller. Now that is strange indeed. Why does it get smaller? Well, let's write the answer down, then we'll talk about what it means. When you go across a period, you increase the number of protons in the nucleus. Now here's the kicker. But you don't increase the energy level. When you go across a period, you get more and more protons in the nucleus, but the energy level stays the same. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at sodium. It's in the third period. It has electrons in the third energy level. It ends with 3s1. 
magnesium in the third period. It has electrons in the third energy level. It ends with 3s2. We go all the way across to argon. It has electrons up into the third energy level. It ends with 3s2, 3p6. All of these elements in period 3 have electrons in the third energy level. But notice the number of protons goes from 11 for sodium up to 18 for argon. So while the energy level remains the same, we are socking away more and more positive charges in the nucleus. What do protons, positively charged particles, do with electrons? Well, they attract them. So when I go across a specific period, the atomic radius gets smaller. Okay, we increase the number of protons in the nucleus, but we don't increase the energy level. And that causes a decrease in the atomic radius. And students have a hard time understanding that. That happens across any period of the periodic table. Let's take a look at this graph right over here. Let's see if I can find it again. When I go across period number two, when I go from lithium to fluorine, sure, the atomic mass increases, but the atomic radius gets smaller. Sodium to chlorine, potassium to bromine, rubidium to iodine, cesium all the way across to astatine. Now, of course, there are a few things that change that trend as we get farther down the periodic table, but very much speaking, for the most part, I should say, the atomic radius gets smaller when you go across a period. So, the, that atomic, pro, or excuse me, periodic property of atomic radius is very important. Once again, remember that when you go down a group, the atomic radius increases, make sure you understand the reasons why. And when you go across a period, the atomic radius decreases, and make sure you understand why. This is the basis behind many of the other periodic properties, which we will talk about later. Thanks. Bye-bye.